typically most enzymes are proteins, right? And we talked about how for proteins and many other molecules, form equals function, right? If that protein doesn't fold properly, it's not going to have the right shape, not going to have the right active shape to be able to accomplish the job that it's meant to accomplish within the cell. Now, we talked about different levels of protein folding, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. We talked about how different kinds of bonds are used to hold the different levels of protein folding together. Now, there are environmental factors that can affect the integrity of those bonds. And if you disrupt those bonds, then the proteins are going to start unfolding. If they start unfolding, they're not going to be able to function very well anymore, right? We talked about this process of denaturation. So being that enzymes are proteins and they're subjected to these environmental factors that can affect their folding, we have to be really careful to make sure that enzymes stay in their optimal environment. So just to um, think about this a little bit more deeply, general environmental factors like temperature, pH, salinity, aka salt content, these can all disrupt some of those bonds that hold secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure together and can affect the way that an enzyme functions. And so every enzyme is going to have an optimal temperature at which it's best folded and can do its, its best job. Every enzyme is also going to have an optimal pH where again it's best folded and it can do its best job. And so cells need to make sure that they maintain that optimal environment for cells for their enzymes to be perfectly folded so they can work at their optimal rate. There are also chemicals that can influence the activity of an enzyme. So let's go to these guys next. There are certain chemicals that are called cofactors. They're non-protein enzyme helpers. So these are other substances typically that will bind to an enzyme and will allow the enzyme to do its best work. Oftentimes without a cofactor, if an enzyme needs one, it won't be able to do its job at all and it renders um, inactive. Now there are two different kinds of cofactors. You have cofactors that are inorganic, meaning not carbon-based. These are typically going to be metals in ionic form. You can also have organic cofactors that are carbon-based. These are usually derived from vitamins that we consume as part of our diet. These organic cofactors are more specifically called coenzymes. So if your mom ever told you, you need a balanced diet so you get all of your vitamins and minerals, maybe she didn't know it or maybe she did. The reason why it's important to get your vitamins and minerals is because they act as these inorganic and organic cofactors that help the enzymes in your body accomplish their job. There are also other molecules or chemicals that can affect the way that an enzyme functions. These other chemicals can come from outside sources, so outside the cell, but they also can be produced by the cell itself to help regulate enzyme activity. Some of these molecules or substances are called inhibitors, meaning that they stop or prevent an enzyme from doing its job. Some examples of inhibitors that come from the outside of the cell might include things like toxins, poisons, pesticides, and also antibiotics. Some of the antibiotics that we use to treat bacterial infections affect the way that bacterial enzymes work. And because they have slightly different enzymes than we do, we can target specifically those bacterial enzymes and disrupt their function while leaving our cells healthy. Now, there are different kinds of inhibitors. On this slide, we're going to talk about competitive inhibitors and non-competitive inhibitors. So first, let's take a look at the very first panel of this image. This shows you an enzyme uh, and its normal substrate. You can see that the substrate is going to fit here into this uh, very uniquely shaped active site, right? And so this is what encourages enzyme specificity. You've got a very specific shape to the active site. It's only going to fit this particular substrate. It's not going to fit a substrate that looks like a star or that looks like a rectangle, right? And so this is what allows enzymes to be very specific for catalyzing only one particular type of chemical reaction. Now, this is under normal conditions, right? So the substrate is going to fit here into the active site, and the enzyme will help to convert it to products. Now, what if there's an inhibitor present? What if this inhibitor is a competitive inhibitor? 
competitive inhibitors will compete with the substrate for binding to the active site. And so the competitive inhibitor is bound here to the active site. That'll prevent the uh, substrate or the reactant from getting in there. If the substrate doesn't get in there, you're not going to convert it to products and essentially the reaction has been shut down. So competitive inhibitors will compete for access to the active site. The other kind of inhibitor is a non-competitive inhibitor. A non-competitive inhibitor shown here in orange is going to bind to some other place within the enzyme that is not the active site. When it binds to this other place, it usually changes the shape of the enzyme and makes it no longer able to effectively catalyze the chemical reaction. So let's say under normal conditions for this enzyme, see this little thumb here. Let's say this thumb had important R groups in the amino acids that were going to help catalyze this chemical reaction. On the far right panel here, when this non-competitive inhibitor binds, it changed the shape of the enzyme and it threw this thumb out, right? It's hanging out to the side now. And maybe even though the substrate could fit here in this active site, all of these R groups on these amino acids are no longer in contact with the substrate and can't help catalyze the chemical reaction. And so the reaction is not going to take place, all because that non-competitive inhibitor changed the shape of the enzyme. Now, keep in mind that those inhibitors um, are sometimes molecules that come from the outside of the cell, but sometimes it can be molecules that the cell itself will produce to help regulate enzyme activity. Let's say you want to turn off an enzyme. You don't need that process taking place right now. The cell can produce an inhibitor, inhibit the enzyme for a little while until maybe that process is necessary again in the cell. And this type of regulation in a cell is really important because if you just let chemical reactions run with the wind, you'd have chemical chaos in the cell, right? The cell wouldn't be able to respond to its environment. It wouldn't be able to regulate homeostasis um, either. And so there are multiple ways in which a cell can regulate enzymes um, within metabolic pathways. One of the ways we just talked about is regulating an enzyme activity using inhibitors or your textbook will also talk about activators. Those are also in existence that will help increase the activity of an enzyme. So that's one way the cell can regulate metabolic processes by enhancing or decreasing the activity of an existing enzyme. The other way in which a cell can regulate these metabolic pathways is by turning on and off the genes that encode for the specific enzyme. So for example, if you don't need a process taking place right now, just don't make the enzyme for it. If the enzyme doesn't exist, you don't have a way to speed up that process and it's not really going to take place at an effective rate within the cell. Or on the other hand, if you do need a process to take place, turn on that gene that codes for that enzyme. Make a whole bunch of that enzyme and all of a sudden you've got increased catalysis of that chemical reaction. Now the last thing that we need to talk about um, in uh, chapter eight is this idea of regulation and going back to feedback uh, regulation that we talked about at the very beginning of the semester and take a look at how uh, enzymes can participate in this feedback regulation. In this particular example, we're specifically looking at feedback inhibition, meaning that we are going to allow the product of a process slow down the process that created it or stop it, inhibit it. So the example we're looking at here is the creation of the amino acid isoleucine from a different amino acid, threonine. So let's say a cell has a lot of threonine and it's building a lot of protein. Um, and while it has a lot of threonine, it's kind of low on the amino acid isoleucine. This particular cell has a series of enzymes that can help convert threonine into isoleucine, which is great because you got a lot of threonine, not a lot of isoleucine, so switch some of it. Now, we don't show all the details of this process. We're only going to focus really on this very first enzyme. This first enzyme goes through the first step of converting threonine to the first intermediate. This enzyme is called threonine deaminase. You don't have to memorize it, but just understand the whole process that we're looking at here in terms of feedback inhibition. So this threonine deaminase will grab a hold of the threonine and start the conversion process um, eventually that will lead to the production of isoleucine. And so the cell will use this enzyme to start making more and more of the isoleucine. If it doesn't use up the isoleucine immediately, isoleucine concentration is going to start to increase. 
The more isoleucine you have, the more frequently it's going to be bumping into other molecules. And interestingly enough, this isoleucine actually can react with this threonine deaminase enzyme. And if the isoleucine bumps into the threonine deaminase, it can actually bind to a little pocket here. So this guy right here, not the active site, but another little pocket on the enzyme. And then when the isoleucine binds to that little pocket, it changes the shape of the threonine deaminase and it makes the active site no longer available to accept the threonine. So isoleucine in this case is acting as an inhibitor. What kind of inhibitor is it functioning as? Competitive? or non-competitive. I hope you pick non-competitive, right? Because non-competitive inhibitors will bind to another place, not the active site on the enzyme and inhibit its function. And so this is a great thing, right? Because if you have a lot of isoleucine, the more isoleucine you have, the more frequently it'll inactivate the threonine deaminase and you won't make excessive amounts of that uh, isoleucine, right? Because you've inactivated that very first step of this pathway. But then as the cell continues to use up the isoleucine, its concentration starts to fall, less frequently does it interact with the threonine deaminase and the enzyme can be turned back on, making or replenishing the isoleucine that was used up. Right, and so an example like this really prevents a cell from wasting a lot of chemical resources by creating more product than it can use at that given moment. So it, it gives that extra regulatory element to the cell to make sure it can maintain its homeostasis. All right, and then lastly, as we anticipate going into the next chapters to talk about cellular respiration and photosynthesis, the um, metabolic pathways, the cell has to work through every minute of every hour of every day, right? It needs to make sure that these processes happen efficiently. And so one way to do this is to take all the enzymes that are necessary for a metabolic process, put them all in the same place, organize them properly so you can pump out those different chemical reactions one right after another, making it very efficient. And so there are structures like organelles and membranes within a cell that can organize these enzymes and bring some order to those metabolic pathways that can otherwise be very complex, right? And so we're going to see how some enzymes within the chloroplast, within the mitochondria, act as structural components within the membrane, um, but also then perform their metabolic tasks as well.